Today, we're talking about one of the most famous investments of all time. We're breaking down how Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, turned his Roth IRA into a $5 billion tax-free piggy bank and three lessons everyday investors just like you can take away from this and apply to your own financial plan. You don't want to miss today's episode. Hey everyone, this is John Boyd, host of the Emerging Wealth Podcast. Thanks for joining us and making us a part of your week. Before we dive in, if you're finding value in our content, please give us a like. This helps us reach more listeners and share quality financial education. Next, I'd recommend visiting our website at www.modernwealth.com. Head on over to our learning center. It's packed with videos and articles designed to help you optimize your wealth. While you're there, consider subscribing to our newsletter. Thanks again for being with us. Now let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Emerging Wealth Podcast. Thanks again for carving out time out of your day to be here. This is, in my opinion, one of the cooler investment stories that is out there because it really underscores the importance of being savvy with your money and being strategic and and taking advantage of things like asset allocation and being on top of of changes to investment laws and tax codes. So a little background is important before we dive into how this $5 billion Roth came into fruition. In 1996, there was a landmark Supreme Court case, Swanson versus the commissioner of the IRS. Without diving into the minutia, this was a landmark case that allowed for IRAs to hold alternative assets, and it supported the idea that an entity could be 100% owned with funds that came from an IRA. So for example, today you could technically buy a rental property using funds that came from an IRA, and a big part of this is this landmark case. You're also able to invest in other alternative investments because of this case. So again, it had significant implications moving forward in investment history. Now let's go ahead and fast forward three years later to 1999. This is when Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, decided to purchase 1.7 million shares of PayPal at just a tenth of a penny. Now, how the heck was he able to do that? Well, number one, he had a low salary that was being paid to him from PayPal at roughly $73,000 a year. So this allowed him to be eligible to contribute directly to a Roth IRA. In 1999, the maximum contribution limit was $2,000. From there, he had the ability to purchase founder shares at a tenth of a penny. So he went ahead and purchased 1.7 million shares and spent around 1700 bucks to purchase those founder shares of PayPal within that Roth. Now, after 1999, tax records will show that Peter Thiel never put another dollar into his Roth IRA ever again. And one reason why is because it eventually became a $5 billion tax-free piggy bank. In just one year, the initial investment of roughly 1700 bucks jumped to $3.8 million. Then in 2002, eBay purchased PayPal, which drove the value of that Roth to $28.5 million. Now, if you didn't already think, wow, this guy is absolutely cleaning up and making a killing, it gets better. In 2004, Peter Thiel meets Mark Zuckerberg, who is still an undergrad at Harvard University and decides to make an investment of $500,000 in Facebook. And of course, we all know what happens with Facebook. Facebook becomes one of the largest social media companies in the world. And by the end of 2008, Peter Thiel's Roth is now worth $870 million. Now, as time went on, Peter ended up diversifying that Roth and made some other big bets within it. And by 2019, his Roth was valued at $5 billion with roughly 96 sub accounts with different investments within that Roth umbrella. Now, realistically, there is a strong chance that that Roth is worth much more today, 
given the market growth since 2019. So an absolutely crazy story. I believe the return, if you if you do the math, is something like 110 or 111 percent per year if you were to annualize it. And while a lot of people hearing that story are probably thinking, "Well, I'm never going to have a five billion dollar Roth. How does any of this apply to me?" Well, that's where I believe there's actually some really powerful lessons to take away from this, and that the everyday investor can pick up something from this story. So without further ado, here are three key lessons from this story that you can apply to your own finances. So lesson number one is that asset allocation and how you invest in your three buckets can make a big difference in how you accumulate wealth over the long run. As a refresher, if you aren't familiar with the three buckets when it comes to asset allocation, you have a pre-tax bucket, that's money that is growing tax deferred like in a traditional IRA or 401k. You put money in, get a tax deduction, and it grows tax deferred. But eventually when you take money out, you'll owe ordinary income taxes. Then you have a second bucket, and that second bucket is a taxable bucket. This is your bucket like your brokerage account or even a savings account that is 100% taxable. And finally, you have your tax-free bucket, which is your Roth. This is money that not only grows tax-free, but any growth and earnings comes out of that bucket tax-free as well. Now, without turning this into an entire episode on the three-bucket strategy, that tax-free bucket where your Roth is, that's an incredibly important and special bucket. That's arguably the most powerful bucket. Generally speaking, the more that we can get into that bucket over the long run, the better. And because it's our most powerful bucket, it's the bucket we typically want to allow to grow longer than any other of our other buckets. For example, if you retire at 60, you should generally avoid using your tax-free buckets like your Roth and allow that money in your Roth to keep growing and cooking and instead live off money from your tax-deferred or taxable buckets. Now, because that tax-free bucket is where I believe we should generally be showing the most love to and try to grow as much as possible, this is where I believe it's totally okay to swing for the fences with a portion of your tax-free bucket. So for instance, if you were invested across your entire portfolio, all three buckets, in 80% stocks and 20% in bonds, generally speaking, you should be fully focused on growing that Roth and having that Roth account be 100% in stocks and not have something like bonds in that account slow down the growth. In addition to that, if you're going to have that Roth or that tax-free bucket be 100% in stocks, I don't think it's a egregious idea to want to have maybe 5 to 10% of that bucket in a more aggressive sleeve than, let's say, traditional stock ETFs or mutual funds. Maybe you like to use individual stocks here. Maybe it's crypto. Maybe it's private equity. Whatever it is, you're going to have a speculative swing for the fences here with a portion of that. I'm not saying everybody should do that, right? Everyone's risk tolerances are going to be different, but within your Roth, it's not necessarily a bad idea to have a small portion where you try to swing for the fences where you believe there's a good risk reward profile in whatever that investment is. Because one, if that 5% allocation that you've allocated to this speculative, super aggressive investment doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world long-term for your Roth. But if it works out, it could really juice the returns of your Roth and give you even more tax-free income. And that's one big reason why Peter Thiel elected to invest his founder shares in his Roth IRA. Generally, companies that are pre-IPO are more speculative. There's more risk involved. Those shares that were worth a tenth of a penny could certainly be worth even less, right? And oftentimes that that happens. Well, if that's the case, it's not the end of the world. It was only a small portion of his overall portfolio. But if it works out and he hits on those shares, well, now that Roth is going to provide a 
potentially lots of tax-free income to him down the road. So bottom line is, I'm not saying everyone has to swing for the fences within the Roth, but you should certainly try to optimize the allocation and maximize the potential of that Roth because it could be a really powerful account that gives you tax-free income down the road. Lesson number two is that diversification matters, even for a multi-billionaire. I've worked with a lot of people, especially in the tech industry, who end up with a large portion of their wealth tied up in a single company. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like betting on a single stock doesn't have the potential to make you a lot of money. I mean, it certainly can. But what I love about the story with Peter is that he starts to explore other investments Even though the company he founded, PayPal, made him millions, he still chooses to spread his chips out over time. And again, as a reminder, as of 2019, his Roth had roughly 96 different sub-accounts with different investments in it. That's really powerful stuff, and I think it's worth highlighting because he is a fantastic example of taking calculated risks swinging for the fences when appropriate, but also still trying to play it smart and spread his chips out. I think a lot of investors are either on one side of the pendulum here. They're either uh, excessively aggressive and may not even realize it. You know, These are the people that have all of their wealth tied up in one sector like tech or maybe just a couple different stocks. And then you have other people on the other side of the equation who are maybe really conservative and the most amount of risk they take is the equity exposure that they have within a target date fund within their 401k. You can still have a diversified approach, yet still have elements of your portfolio that are maybe a little bit more aggressive than traditional norms. The final lesson is that staying on top of tax and investment laws is highly underrated. We go back to that story about Peter Thiel. I guarantee you, his tax advisory team was aware of the court case in 1996 that allowed him to buy founder shares within that Roth three years later, right? That's a really savvy move, but you have to know how to play the game in order to take advantage of something like that. And understanding tax and investment laws are all about playing the game and building long-term wealth, right? We often get so caught up on what investments to pick, and we forget about all the little things that could also drive wealth, like being strategic with tax planning. But the only way that you can be strategic about any of that is that if you actually understand the laws and how those laws change, because they're constantly changing. So if you aren't staying on top of all these little changes in tax laws and so forth that could impact you financially, I would encourage you to either A, invest the time and resources to learn about those changes, or B, hire someone to help you navigate what all those tax changes are and how they impact you. Because again, picking investments is only half the battle. You got to know how to play the game and part of playing the game is knowing when laws change and how they could positively or negatively impact you. So there you have it, guys. That's the story of Peter Thiel's $5 billion Roth IRA. Just because I know some folks may be thinking it, no, it's not too good to be true. That $5 billion Roth IRA is not subject to any income tax, even though it's worth $5 billion. So if you took out $1 billion next year, you would not have to pay any ordinary income tax on that distribution. On a side note, that $5 billion Roth IRA is still subject to estate tax. In 2024, if an individual has an estate larger than $13.61 million, their heirs would be subject to a 40% estate tax on the value of anything over $13.61 million in the estate that they inherited. The good news is is that the heirs, if they inherited this massive Roth, they can tap that Roth completely tax-free to cover any potential estate tax liability. So it's still a boatload of money. 
As a reminder, everything on today's podcast was general education only and not deemed to be specific investment, tax, or legal advice. If you need specific guidance, you can reach out to us at www.modernwealth.com. That's modern spelled with no vowels, wealth.com. It's been a lot of fun, guys, and I'll see you next time.